um, on that awful day, Tim Brown came close to death, not once, not twice, but several times. Just one different turn, uh, staying a moment longer in a spot, would surely have left him among the 343 New York City firefighters to die that day. Tim lost 93 of his friends that day, including his two best friends. Tim Brown is a retired, decorated, 20-year FDNY firefighter. He was a member of the rescue squad, or the, yes, the rescue squad, which is an elite squad that rescues other firefighters. Uh, he was a first responder, uh, the 2001 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, a first responder to the 1993 terrorist attack, uh, also on the World Trade Center, and a veteran of the New York Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, a uh, team that responded to the 1991 terrorist attack on the AP Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Tim's last assignment in the FDMY was Rescue Company Number 3. He served several years in Mayor Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management. Tim spent two years on special detail to the federal government, serving as a special assistant to the Secretary of Health and Human Services during the anthrax terrorist attacks in 2001 and 2, earning his top secret government clearance while helping to build command and control into that department. Tim has become a media commentator on the events of 9-11 and has appeared on all major news channels, including Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, and dozens of local news programs. He has appeared in many documentaries and co-founded TheBravest.com and EmergencyStream.com with his brother Chris Brown, also a firefighter in Providence, Rhode Island. Tim has been a leader in defending the memory of those lost on 9-11 at Ground Zero. He believes he was spared to tell their stories, to be the voice that his friends no longer have. Tim says the greatest love is giving your life for someone you didn't know. Let's give a warm welcome to Tim Brown. They'll never take us down, though some may try. We're gonna stand our ground, it's do or die. The freedom that we found can't be denied. Please, he deserved that, right? Marine. Um, so I, I've been uh, unexpectedly involved uh, the last maybe three days in something called uh, Task Force Pineapple. You might have heard of it. Uh, yep. Uh, I, got, I got involved through some special forces and intelligence community f uh, friends, and uh, we've been setting up, uh, which will hopefully be a successful, a longer lasting successful pipeline for our allies, our friends, and for American citizens. Uh, so I just want to say operationrecovery.org, operationrecovery.org. And they need everyone's support uh, to make to make this happen. Uh, these these folks, these veterans, uh, are making us proud again uh, about what Americans do. So, uh, on the morning of. September 11, 2001, I was a New York City firefighter detailed into Mayor Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management. Our office was 7 World Trade Center on the 23rd floor. I would go in every morning uh, and I would buy all the newspapers and I would go to the th third floor restaurant or uh, cafeteria and I would have my little breakfast and I would read the newspapers which, because we didn't have smartphones, right? And I, and I wanted to read the newspapers every day to just keep an eye on what was happening in the city. I was a supervisor of the field responders. Our group was about 15, and our job was to go to the scene of larger emergencies and disasters in New York City and represent Mayor Giuliani. And it's amazing when you represent a mayor like Rudy how th things get done very quickly and very efficiently, because they don't want to hear his voice on the phone <laughs> or, or his foot, you know where. 
so it was, it was very, a very successful program. In our group, we had cops, firefighters, because in New York City, we have sanitation police. We have a power company, Con Edison was our power company. They were in our group. So we always had an expert in the group on a, a, some disaster that might be happening. So I'm sitting there in the cafeteria reading the papers and the power goes out. Very unusual for a modern high-rise building in New York City. Hmm. The people who were facing the glass all at once jumped up and started running toward the exit, running by me. And I grabbed a young lady by the shoulders and kind of shook her back to reality. And I said, what happened? And she said, a plane hit the tower. And that's the first I knew of it. Now, this wasn't the first time it ever happened in New York City, right? We had helicopters sometimes, a pilot would have a heart attack or, you know, we had um, the, the bomber uh, that flew into uh, the Empire State Building. So it wasn't unheard of, but it was still a, a major emergency. Game face on. I went up to the 23rd floor, made sure that our listening post, our dispatcher was uh, doing a full activation, which is 150 phone calls they have to make to activate our emergency operations center. So Mike Lee gave me the thumbs up. He was a supervisor there. I went to the emergency operations center. Mike Berkowitz was the supervisor there. He was powering up this incredible Star Wars looking um, emergency operations center with 150 workstations. We would soon be inundated by people from city, state, federal, government, and private sector partners who help us. I went down to my car, I took off my tie and my dress shirt, and I put on my, we call a raid jacket, mayor's office on the front and back, and heavy leather boots, and the, they made us wear this stupid green helmet so everybody knew who we were. And we're trained as firefighters to always look at three sides of a building before you go into a building. So a building that's on fire, a building that's possibly going to collapse just to get a size up in your head. And I wanted to do that on this morning. And I went up an exterior concrete staircase from the street level to the plaza level. And I ran in between two of the World Trade Center buildings and the tower, the tower, the North Tower, the first one to be hit was on my right. But I looked out over the plaza and it was littered with debris that was on fire, black smoke, white smoke, dust, and if you remember in the videos, all the, those papers the off from the offices was fluttering down. It, it looked like Armageddon. And I started to realize that my first intuition that it was a small plane or a helicopter might be wrong. I went into that tower at the plaza level and I had to go from the plaza level down to the street level inside the building. There was an escalator and there were hundreds of office workers making their way onto this escalator. So it looked like a funnel. And something struck me in that moment that has stayed with me since. And it was what the people were not doing. They were not pushing, screaming, kicking, trampling each other. In fact, it was the opposite. For every person who was disabled, pregnant, obese, injured, there were four or five office workers, not cops or firemen, office workers helping that person. And I said to myself internally, no matter what happens today, we're going to be okay because it's the true human spirit, right? The true human spirit is to help each other. If we're walking out of here in, in an hour and somebody trips, everybody goes to help that person. That's what we do. Right? Except for a few bad ones. <laughs> and th then we treat differently, but that, that's the true spirit of humanity. It's good. I got on that escalator, and as I went down the escalator, and the lobby revealed itself to me, I could see hundreds of firefighters awaiting their order to go up. And the firefighters were wearing their turnout gear, 
and they have the yellow stripes, reflective stripes on it. And in that moment, with hundreds of firefighters awaiting their fate, I chuckled because I realized why the cops called us bumblebees. <laughs> because <laughs> when we get together, it looks like a hive. We look like a hive. It looks like a whole bunch of bumblebees in a hive. And you know, in this in this terrible moment, I I think I might have smiled a little bit. And I got to the bottom of the escalator, and right in front of me was a bumblebee, named Firefighter Chris Blackwell who I had worked with in Rescue 3 in the Bronx for seven years. And not just in the same company, but we worked on the same shift. So we lived together, we breathed together, we ate together, we slept together. And we did incredible things in horrific situations together. And when Chris was not a Bronx Harlem firefighter, when he went home to Connecticut, he was a paramedic. So all this guy did with his life was help other people. And we were the Bronx guys, so you know, we didn't really follow the regulations. We didn't really even know there were regulations. <laughs> and uh, and we, you know, we wouldn't shave like you were supposed to. Uh, you know, our gear was all tattered and torn and burned up, and the helmet was like it was in a furnace our helmets, because we went to so many fires, and it wouldn't sit straight on your head, so it would sit a little crooked on your head. And we were very busy. You know, we, we covered the entire borough of the Bronx in north of Harlem in Manhattan. So our faces weren't always that clean, maybe some dried snot and stuff. <laughs> and, and so, I get to the bottom of the escalator, and right in front of me, right here, is firefighter Chris Blackwell, one of my very best friends. And we always greeted each other the same way. We came like this, face to face. We came to attention, and he always had the unlit stub of a cigar in his mouth, hanging out of the corner. And he would go like this, and he'd take it out of his mouth, and we lean in, kiss on the lips, <laughs> and then we come back up, and he put the cigar back in. And granted, we did love each other like, like, like he was my real brother, but we just thought it was funny as heck to watch the reaction of all the other firemen when we did it. <laughs> and, and uh, we did that in the, in the North Tower on the morning of September 11th. Um, when his kids found out that we did that, it made them very happy that in the last moments of his life, he knew he was loved. So after we kissed, Chris said to me, to me, this is really bad. And that's two experienced firefighters who worked together for a long time. That's saying something. I said, I know, Chris. Be careful, I love you. He said, I love you too. And after Chris said that, he turned around and he went in the stairwell, knowing he would likely not come back. Someone yelled my name across the top of the bumblebees. And I looked over and I could see my best friend, Captain Terrence S. Hatton, because he was six foot four and with his helmet and boots, he was six, seven, six, eight. And Terry was the captain of the Elite Rescue Company One, the Manhattan Special Operations Varsity Team. And Terry was the captain of that place. He was the boss because he was that good. He was that experienced and he was that smart. And the leadership of the fire department at that time recognized that Terry was the future, uh, future leader of the New York City Fire Department. And being that he was the Manhattan captain, 
His tie was all the way up. He was clean shaven. His coat was perfect. His helmet was brand new. That was Terry. This big, this big, big guy, right? And I ran over to him, and I threw my arms around, me, around him, and I, and I kind of got lost in his chest and his shoulders because he was just that big. And we squeezed each other tight, and he kissed me on the cheek, and he said to me in my ear, I love you, brother. I may never see you again. And of course, the dumb Bronx Harlem guy, me, blew him off because we had done so many things together. We had crawled through the rubble together so many times. We, we, had, been, we had gone to places that no one had ever had any business coming back alive from. But we always did, and we did it together. So I blew him off. I was like, yeah, I'll see you when, you know, be careful, I'll see you when we're done. But Terry was a smart one, remember? I love you, brother. I may never see you again. And Captain Terry Hatton turned around, took his men in the stairwell, and went up. And they made it to the 83rd floor of the North Tower where they were saving people's lives and putting the fire out. A fireman came running into the lobby where we were yelling that another plane hit the other tower, and that's the first that I heard of it. The leadership huddled up, and it was decided how to split our forces, and that we decided to send Assistant Chief Donald Burns and myself to the South Tower to open that command post and try to manage the second biggest disaster in the history of the city of New York that was occurring at the exact same time as the first biggest disaster in the history of the city of New York right next door. Now, Chief Burns was another big guy, six, like Terry, 6'4". If you looked up in the dictionary, Irish fire chief, it would be his mug because he had the red rosy cheeks and he had the lines of knowledge and experience permanently etched in his face. And he only talked out of the right corner of his mouth. This side didn't move over here. Only this side moved. And he had a thicker New York accent. And he, he was 40, 41 years in the New York City Fire Department. He was arguably the most respected chief in the job at the time. And he was my friend and we're running to the South Tower together. And I said, Chief, what do you need me to do? He said, to me, not much you and I could do. I ordered a fifth alarm, another 350 firemen. But we gotta wait, because the first 350 are going to that building. We gotta wait, we're on our own. Do, you, do your best and be careful. We're, we're at war, Tim. And I saluted him, I said, yes, sir, chief. A woman came running over to us, screaming that there were people trapped in an elevator. Chief gave me the nod, go with her. I followed her, he went to the command post. She took me to the elevator banks in the South Tower. In this one elevator car, the hoistway doors were open so you could see into the shaft but the elevator, the elevator car had not come down all the way. Just at the top, you could see the bottom of the elevator car. You could just see into it, right? It was about eight inches or something. And you could see all the people's feet of everyone who was trapped, and they were screaming. And I remember seeing the men's shirt sleeve and jackets as they were trying to pull the car down a little bit more so they could jump out. I didn't know it at the time, but that car had free fall in 70 floors. When Flight 175 came in, it snapped the cable of that car. And so these poor people had taken this ride thinking they were dead.
but the elevator emergency brakes worked the way they were supposed to and, and stopped it before it crashed into the concrete pit. So they had just taken this ride. They were alive, but they were trapped. They were yelling, and they were yelling and screaming also because the elevator pit below them was full of jet fuel that was on fire. And they were getting burned. And what they needed right now was a real fireman, not a mayor's office guy. In my uh, disbelief of what I'm looking at, I turned to see if I could see anything or anyone to help. And my shoulder hit a person who had come up behind me, and I looked over, and it was a bumblebee. And I looked up at his face, and it was firefighter Michael Lynch from Ladder 4, where I had worked for a year and a half. And I had worked with Michael when he was a new fireman. And we knew each other. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Timmy, I got it. Three words between firemen who knew each other, who trained together, who worked together. He had the experience, the training, the tools and equipment, because he brought a whole fire truck of stuff with him, and the intestinal fortitude to save the lives of those people. And later on, I, I sit down with Michael's widow, Denise, and I tell her, in that moment when he said, Timmy, I got it, he may as well have had wings coming out of his back because he was the angel who appeared to save the lives of those people. We know Michael saved, we can prove two women, we think three women. And I'll come back to it in a minute. Over the radio, urgent, 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 third plane incoming, it's ours. Take cover, confirmed by the FBI, third plane incoming, get in the stairwells, urgent, urgent, urgent. Michael, you got this, I have to go. I went to the command post, I found a phone that worked. I dialed zero and I said to the operator, I, I'm in the World Trade Center with Mayor Giuliani, I need to talk to the White House immediately. And she tried to get through and she couldn't get through and I said, okay, then the Pentagon. And she said the Pentagon's under attack, which is the first we knew of it. I talked to New York State Emergency Management Office and they assured me that the fighter jets were coming to protect us overhead as fast as they could. We could not do our job if planes kept crashing into us. The first time in the history of the Army known as the New York City Police Department, the New York City Fire Department, and the Port Authority Police Department, over 50,000 we couldn't handle it ourselves. We needed help from the US military. The lobby was filling up with people who were badly injured. Imagine being one of these people coming in, and I know we have people in the audience who actually experienced this. But imagine coming down a dark, smoky, wet stairwell, 70, 80 floors, injured, burned, bloody, broken, around and around and around and around. Single file, because there's only room for one line going down and the firemen and cops coming up. And then you get to this door that says lobby on it, and you open the door up and it's bright and dry. And there's firemen and cops there. And you're injured, and what do you do? I made it. Boom. They'll take care of me. So that's what happened in the lobby. And we had injured people all over the lobby and it was impeding our evacuation. So Chief Burns asked me to go get the paramedics. And I ran out, that's why I left the South Tower. I went out on Liberty Street right there in the middle of Liberty Street, forever burned into my visual memory, was a dead fireman who was crushed by a woman who jumped. Danny Sir. Danny was the first fireman murdered on September 11th. Someone yelled my name. I looked over, it was firefighter Michael Lynch, the angel. And he was getting 
the jaws of life off his truck, ladder four, the spreaders that we use in car crashes, because he was going to use that hydraulic tool to force that car down and make more room for those people to jump out. But the motor for that is very heavy. It's a two-person job. So I started running toward him to help him, but another fireman got there first, and we waved to, to each other. And that's the last time I saw my friend, the angel firefighter Michael Lynch. I found the paramedics over on West Street and myself and three paramedics and the stretcher and all their stuff, the four of us went running back to go back into the South Tower, Tower 2. And we were running along the, the, right along the front of 3 World Trade Center, which was the Marriott Hotel, which adjoined the tower. And we came, because the tower was set back, so we came around the corner on the sidewalk and we were about 20 feet from the door of the South Tower when it collapsed. And it, it was so obvious because the steel that first snapped, that started the collapse, it was so loud that it echoed through the canyons of Lower Manhattan. We're trained as firefighters, you can never outrun a collapse. It will always catch you and kill you. And I knew this from my experience. I yelled to the medics, follow me, and we ran right back into the Three World Trade Center. I knew we had just passed a door. And I said, if we can get this building between us and the, and the tower, we might have a chance. We went in that door. It was called the Tall Ships Restaurant that was in the lobby of the Marriott Hotel. And it was as clear as this room. And just like that, it went black. I hit the ground, crawling. Everything that wasn't nailed down was in my face. Tower 2 was collapsing onto the Marriott, and the Marriott was collapsing around us. I knew my only chance at living would be to find a vertical column. Because sometimes, when we find people alive, they're at a, the strongest part of the building is the vertical column. I crawled as fast as I could. You couldn't breathe, breathe because the dust was so thick, it was filling your nose and your mouth and your eyes and your ears. I was trying to stick my face in my shirt to filter it. The noise I can only describe to you as sitting on the tarmac at JFK, surrounded by 747s that are full blast. I found, I found, like I did it, because I didn't. I was led to a vertical column because God didn't want to take me away that day. And so he led me to a vertical column, and I wrapped my arms around it, and I held on as tight as I could, and I just waited to get crushed. My helmet blew off my head. The wind was so strong that it blew my legs up in the air because all the air was being pushed out of the building as it collapsed, and it was going where I was. So I'm holding on. I lost my helmet. My legs are up in the air. You can't breathe. You can't see. You can't hear. And I just remember thinking how upset I was that I couldn't hold my family one more time and tell them that I loved them. And I waited to be crushed. And as fast as it started, it stopped. Probably less than 30 seconds. It seemed like hours. And I really wanted to live. I went back to the, where the door was that we came in, but the building was collapsed, so there was no door or anything. There was just steel and rubble. And I, I found a truck. I, I, I can't explain to this day. And the motor was running, the diesel motor, and the headlights were on. And all I could think was it was a truck bomb. And so I turned around and I went the other way, back deeper into the Marriott Hotel toward the lobby through the restaurant, or what was the restaurant. And there was a metal roll-down gate that was down. Later on, I figured out that was the roll-down gate. When the restaurant was closed, they would put that down and separate it from the lobby of the hotel. But in the collapse, it went down. 
And so I slid my fingers under it to lift it up. And I lifted it up a couple inches, and all these fingers came from the other side. And there were about 15 people, firefighters and civilians, who were trapped on the other side of the little roll-down gate. And I told them, we have to go that way, we have to go that way. And they said, there is no that way. The, the collapse came through right behind them in the lobby of the hotel and killed half the firefighters and the civilians they were rescuing. So we turned around again and we went back in the restaurant. What was the restaurant? And a, one of the ladies we were with saw a firefighter with his bright flashlight coming from the outside. And he was yelling, come this way, come this way. So we went to him. About 35 of us lived in that space. They later did a scientific study because they wanted to understand why that was like a cocoon for us. And in that scientific study, they just determined that the wind where I was that was trying to blow me out of the building onto Liberty Street, the wind was 185 miles an hour. Now, again, evidence that I was not alone there that day because no human can hold on to a piece of steel when there's a 185 mile an hour wind trying to blow you out in the street. So I had other strength from God who didn't want to take me. And so for 20 years, I've been telling the story of the heroes and the horrors. I told you several stories about firefighters who I personally encountered who made the choice in that moment to give their life for someone they didn't know. Chris Blackwell, Terry Hatton, Mike Lynch, Patty Brown, that's what the police officers and firefighters did that day. They made conscious decisions in the moment. They said it to me, Terry said it to me. Chris said it to me. They still decided to fulfill their oath. They took, same for the firefighters and same for the police officers that day. We call them heroes. Well, you know what? And I know they don't like to me to hear, and the military people here in the audience won't like this, but the day they went like this and they said they followed the oath, that's the day they became a hero. Because you never know if you're asked, going to be asked to fulfill that, that oath. Just some numbers. It's the 20th anniversary. On the day of September 11, 2001, 2,977 innocent human beings were murdered by radical Islamic terrorists. In the beginning, some foolish people tried to get me not to say that. <laughs> and, I, and I told them, go look in, go look in your own museum in this place where you put it in your museum and now you're gonna give me a hard time? I don't think so. And notice in that 2977, I did not say Americans. A lot of people that talk about 9-11 make that mistake because it was 2,977 innocent human beings from 90 countries. That's why when you go in the 9-11 museum, there's the flags of 90 countries there. So this was more than an attack on America. Certainly, certainly it was an attack on America. But it was an attack on humanity. It was an attack on innocent people. Right? New York is the melting pot. We, we figure out how to get along. Out of that 2977, 658 were from one financial firm, Cantor Fitzgerald. Did you hear what I just said? 658 
It's just like a number that rolls out, out of your mouth. It's not. Most of the horrific video and photos you see from that day are people who are hanging out of the, the building or being forced to make the choice between burning to death or jumping. Or somebody smashed out the windows because they couldn't breathe. And then you have 50 people trying to get air from that window, and what do they do? They're, they're pushing forward, trying to get air, pushing, and what happens to the person in front? They get pushed out. Most of those people in the North Tower were Cantor Fitzgerald people. Fire, the, the, the first responders, the previous largest loss of life for the New York City Fire Department was 12. Many decades ago in Manhattan on 23rd Street. 343. One, about 100 of them were my friends. The Port Authority Police Department, the number is 37, and they're a small police department. Largest loss of life of law enforcement in one incident in American history. Percentage-wise, they lost more of their job than the fire department did because they're a small job. 23. NYPD police officers. 14 of them were from their elite emergency service unit, like my friends Chris and Terry were from our special operations. 14 of their 23 were their elite cops. They call them rescue cops, maybe the best cops in the world. And every, every one of them did what Chris and Terry and Patty Brown and all my other friends, all the men of Rescue One did. They chose other people's lives over their own. And that's what the Bible says, right? No greater love than to lay down your life for your neighbor. And those are the heroes and the horrors of 9-11. And whenever we speak about 9-11, we need to tell the whole truth. People didn't die, they were murdered, and they were murdered by radical Islamic terrorists. How poignant for current events today, right? So, the next few weeks are going to be tough for us. The threat level is, um, couldn't be blinking red more than it is. Pray for our firefighters, our police officers, our intelligence community, our military. Pray for these gold star families who are hurting so bad right now. That's what we can do. And um, Operation Recovery, I think that's what I said before, operationrecovery.org, if you can help. Um, and ma help make America proud again. We, we don't need someone else to do it. We can do it. Regular Americans can do it. So that's, that's it. I'm, I'm happy to be here and alive and, and, um, and, and not sick. Many, 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 many of my friends are sick and many of them have died from 9-11 illness. So this continues to devastate my community. Um, so pray for them too. So do you want to do some... Uh, Questions or stuff? So? Oh.
Tim, you and I uh, spoke on the phone several weeks ago when we were, we were introduced by a dear mutual friend of the Steamboat Institute and a friend of Tim's, Deborah Burlingame, whose brother Chick Burlingame was pilot of the American Airlines flight that was crashed into the Pentagon on 9-11. Deborah and Tim have worked together closely as a voice for 9-11 families and have been leaders on many fronts in that effort. Um, you and I also talked about the importance of your being here today, two weeks to the day before the 20th anniversary. Many of our young leaders that we have featured this weekend were either not born or much too young to remember. Is there any special, I mean, other than what the, the poignant stories you have conveyed today, anything else you would like to share with them about the importance and significance and why we have to make sure this never happens again? Absolutely, and, and uh, again, the, the timing couldn't be more, more maybe terrible, right? Because we're pulling out of Afghanistan and, and uh, you know, possibly giving haven to radical Islamic terrorists who want to attack America. And, and that's how 9-11 was born 20 years ago. And, you know, are we giving them haven again? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess it's a matter of, of opinion, but I think that we're, we're, we're taking a really great risk right here. So I would say to the young folks to keep an eye on this and, and, and f fight for America that these Al-Qaeda or whatever you want to call them, it's still the same thing. It's a radical Islamic ideology. Um, and the, the proper term, and I learned this, I didn't know this in the beginning, the proper term is Islamist, right? Because those, and it is different, I, I have Muslim friends. Um, and, you know, we, we had to f figure out our friendship, right? Because they didn't really know where I was coming from. But, but when you pinpoint it and you say Islamist, an Islamist is someone who wants to impose their beliefs on you. Where my friends, my, my friend Nita is a brilliant doctor at UCLA and, and I mean, today she's probably has her hands on dozens of patients who are dying from coronavirus and she's saving them. And she's an awesome American Muslim human being. But we also have to be able to call Islamists, Islamists. And we have to be able, we have to be able to punch them in the nose when they're wrong. Because if, if we don't, if we, if we just turn our backs, it's gonna happen again. You know, with the, the anniversary being two weeks from today, what would you like us to remember the most besides the horrific event itself? So when I say Rudy, when Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Giuliani, he's still my friend today. When Mayor Giuliani in the, in the week after 9-11 said it was the worst day of his life and the best day of his life, I was so angry at him. My best friend was like a son to him, Terry, Captain Terry Hatton, the big guy. And I, Terry was still in the rubble. And I, in my, I, never, I don't think I ever said it to his face but like, how could you say that when Terry and so many heroes are in the rubble? How could you even bring up that it was the best day of your life? But years later, I realized he was right. And I, I talked about some of those stories in the story I just told about the goodness of humanity. In, in those days and weeks after 9-11, one, one of our biggest problems was all these people coming to help us. I mean, fire engines were streaming to New York from all over America, and police cars, and construction workers, and dump trucks. And, and now this is in New York. People are on the side of the road on West Side Highway waving the American flag. That doesn't happen in New York a lot. <laughs> But they were on that, you know, in, the, in those days after. So th those were beautiful 
unifying days that did not last very long. Great. Um, I know that there are things that concern both you and Deborah about um, how certain people are choosing to remember 9-11 today. Deborah had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal not long ago when members of Congress were comparing the 9-11 terrorist, or they were comparing the January 6th incident at the Capitol to 9-11, and I know Deborah was outraged. I spoke with her on the phone after reading her op-ed. How did that make you feel, and, and what are your thoughts on how some people seem to be minimizing or trivializing 9-11 by such a comparison? Without getting political, because I do work for the federal government, um, I just want people to remember the magnitude of September 11, 2001, especially the young people. And, and that's why I have this voice. And this is why I travel around the country. I'll be in uh, Michigan in two days. Um, and then I'll be on the, you know, the big networks uh, next week. It, it's why, that's why it's so important that we have the voice and that we speak the truth about what happened. And I count on everyone here to carry this story forward and, and tell the story, the whole story, the horrors of 9-11. I mean, how can, you, how can you compare something else to those poor people in the elevator? Yeah. You know, that's a true story that I saw with my own eyes. So you, you can't compare, I don't know, anything, not, not in our lifetime, to the horrors of 9-11. Of so any, anybody who does that has a, a different agenda and, and, uh, and it upsets me greatly because it minimizes the truth of what happened uh, to New York and to America. We have seen this week egregious errors in judgment and lack of cohesive, coherent strategy by the Biden administration. I know you're, you said you're an employee of the federal government. I realize you may not be able to totally freely speak your mind, but what would you like to see the Biden administration do to prevent this from happening again? Well, I would recommend putting in Google Aaron Vaughn documentary. Aaron Vaughn was a Navy SEAL uh, killed in the shoot down of uh, Extortion 17 10 years ago. Uh, and watch the documentary uh, about what happened to the Vaughn family and what they were put through. And I'm just going to leave it at that. There are a lot of similarities to what's happened over the last week. Um, but but do, do go look at that movie, uh, Aaron Vaughn documentary. I, I, f I forget the name of it. If somebody has it, we can shout it out. But um, it's not the first time that people have been treated like this. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, I give great credit to regular Americans. I said it at the beginning. Regular American veterans, special forces guys, friends of mine, people from the intelligence community have banded together to do the right thing by our friends and allies in Afghanistan and to do our very best to get them out. Um, and, and I'm very proud of, of being on the periphery of that and being able to help a little bit. Um, but we're, with, or, with or without government help, we're going to get it done. And you know, I watched Jay Redman on CNN earlier today, uh, and, and they specifically asked Jay, is, is the federal government helping you? And he said, absolutely not. They're doing it on their own. Thank you. Fallen Angel. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So Fallen Angel, Extortion 17, and it's the story of the, the Vaughn family and, and uh, how difficult it's been for them. Thank you. Um, this isn't directly related to 9-11, but you have brave law enforcement officers, whether it's police or firefighters, putting their lives on the line every day. 
What's, how's the morale of the law enforcement community with the, all this defund the police insanity? This is one of the craziest things I've, I, 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 on the list of crazy things. <laughs> like, really? It's, 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 it just leaves you speechless. You know, what, what, what these heroes do for us every day, day in and day out. You know, I, I'm a, I volunteer with the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers Foundation, and they pay off uh, the, the mortgages of, of police and fire, among many things. Um, but to, to deal with these families and to see what these families go through, um, in, in, you know, and we're helping them, but you know, we're going to come in and pay off your mortgage if you have children under 16 years old so they don't have to move out of the house, right? And we do this all over the country. Um, and so I see the pain of the families on, uh, in law enforcement, especially on a regular basis. I, I was hanging out with one of my FBI buddies the other day. He's a very senior guy. And I made the mistake of walking up to him with a Starbucks tea in my hand. And he, his eyes went like this. He was like, are you kidding me? He said, do you know what, if they know I'm, if they know I'm a cop, you know what they do to our coffee? Yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't deserve it, and they deserve our love and support. And every time we go by them, we should say, thank you. And uh, um, do the very best we can. I, I, don't, I don't know how anyone would want to be a cop now in, in this environment. But I love them. They're my heroes. Um, and maybe we can turn this around. We're getting near to the end of our time here. Um, I think most of these questions that have come in have we've already covered. Um, any final thoughts you would like to leave us with? Any, you know, this is an action-oriented audience. Uh, they like to know what they can do to help, and, and you've already talked to our young people um, some about what they can do. Uh, any any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? And once again, if you want to remind people about Pineapple Express and yeah. and the other organization, please feel free to use this time. Yeah, um, I, I just mentioned the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Uh, they, they do pay off the mortgages of fallen police and firefighters throughout America. They, uh, they build uh, um, um, smart, adaptive homes for ca catastrophically injured military. Right now, the waiting list for that is 1,000. Um, over 1,000 catastrophically injured military. They pay off the mortgages of Gold Star families. So, you know, they might have just had 13 added to their list the other day. Um, and they got a, a big tract of land donated in Lando Lakes, Florida, uh, by a billionaire who uh, just gave them the land. And they're going to build 100 adaptive smart homes in a community specifically built for injured military, police, fire. Uh, and they're going to have buses that run to Disney and Universal every day for the kids. And the community will be built for wheelchairs and for disabled. And they will live in a community together. And what we're hoping is that one day that will be one of many communities throughout America for our heroes. Fantastic. Let's round of applause for a true American hero, Tim Brown. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.